Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello my darlings. Lovely to see you as always. Today I got a ton of stuff to tell you. First of all, we're going to do Christy Nome, who is the governor of South Dakota and a real Trump supporter, plus Don Jr. Trump 45. Uh, Madison Cawthorn, who is a representative from North Carolina, the country of Togo in West Africa, used to be called Togoland, because they are under a military dictatorship, and somebody said, please look at what's going to happen there. And I thought, oh, okay, first of all, I better find out where it is. <laughs> I'd never even heard of it. But uh, no, I've looked at that too. Plus, because so many people wrote in, I've done George Harrison's transition pictures. So uh, I'll tell you those. Thank you to all the people who commented after the last video. <laughs> what's remarkable is is how many people went out and ordered Tonic Alchemy after I said I took it. <laughs> uh, you, you know, don't do that. <laughs> just because I take it doesn't mean you have to take it. Do your own research before you just go buying these things. Remember the Q-Link? People went out and bought these en masse after I said I wore them. And uh, many people actually found benefits from them, which is tremendous. But I don't know if it works. The only clue I have is that when I wear it, I feel calmer. If I wear it at night, accidentally, if I leave it on and don't take it off before I go to bed, I don't sleep very well at all. It keeps me awake. Then, if I wake up and I take it off, I go to sleep and I sleep the rest of the night. So it does something, I just don't know what. So my whole life is littered with things that I do that I don't know why I do them. <laughs> so this is our new segment. I don't know if it works, but I do it anyway. Here's another one. Vico toothpaste. Uh, you know, I have typical British teeth from the 60s. Uh, they're not good, but they're strong, but they don't look very good. Uh, but for years, I've been brushing my teeth, not with toothpaste, but with this stuff. It's Ayurvedic mouth medicine from India. It's imported from India. Vico Vajradanti. I started using it years ago after a guy I know said, you know, I switched to Vico from toothpaste because it doesn't contain glycerin. And according to him, what glycerin does is coat your teeth to keep bacteria out. But at the same time, it keeps bacteria in, this coating of glycerin. And so he decided that he didn't want any of that. He would preserve his teeth by using stuff that doesn't contain glycerin, which apparently was Vico. And I thought, oh yeah, okay. I have no idea if it works, but I'm game for that. <laughs> and I've used it ever since. It's not the most pleasant tasting thing in the world, but it contains 18 herbs and barks, which basically means I'm cleaning my teeth with tree bark. Uh, it also says on the box that it contains a, a free toothbrush. So let's find out. <laughs> I'm now curious to see if it contains a free toothbrush. No, it doesn't. It says on the box it contains a free toothbrush, but it doesn't contain a free toothbrush. But anyway, it's imported from India, so what am I going to do? But uh, no, I've been using this ever since. So that's another example of something I do. I don't know why, and I don't know if it works, but I use it anyway. <laughs> Vico Vajradanti. All right. Let's get on with Christy Nome, who has been the governor of South Dakota since 2019. At one point, she was in the U.S. House of Representatives, but no longer. And she is a Trump-supporting, abortion-hating, uh, anti-gay marriage type person. Uh, it, and she was also against the mask mandate with the COVID thing. She thought that large gatherings were a good idea. Let's spread this thing around. Masks? Are you crazy? Stop that nonsense. She's that kind of person. She also had this campaign which was trying to combat meth addiction in South Dakota. And it was called meth. We're on it. And it was supposed to be like, yeah, we're on this problem. But it came out as meth. We're on it. 
<laughs> anyway, she's against legalizing pot. She was one of those people alleging voter fraud after the election. Uh, she was at the CPAC conference uh, last week, and um, apparently, according to uh, a poll taken then, only 4% of people wanted to see her as president. And 100% of people in the rest of the country, I'm sure. So I looked at her pictures. And when I found her, she was scrambling up a hillside. Just scramble, 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 scramble. Just above her, on a terrace, was a flag. This was like a marker of accomplishment. So maybe that is being the governor, being a successful governor of South Dakota. Although the word successful maybe doesn't apply. But just saying, you know, she got that. Over there, and indeed above her, there were other flags. These were markers of other accomplishments in the future. She reached a second one. But now something interesting happened because there were two hills. The one above her, directly above her head, which had a flag on it too, so she could scale that peak and get that flag and get that accomplishment. Or she could continue, leave that one alone, turn her back on that, leave that one alone and go down here, where I'm pointing, which you can't see, it's like there, and pick up flags in a different direction. So I guess she could say, I think given that CPAC thinks I only have a 4% chance of making president, maybe I'll leave this ambition behind and start again over there and aim for it later, further down the line. So she goes along, she picks up another of these flags, as I said, then there's a sort of causeway that she can cross. And now she comes to this next hill, and that has a flag on it too. And I think that she will go, oh, I'm so tempted. I'm so, maybe it is the presidency in 2028, something like that. Maybe it's that far away. But there were significant markers that she had in her head of where she wanted to be in the future. And she was going to get there. I mean, she's very determined and has a sort of rock-solid belief in herself, which is not necessarily helpful to anybody around her, but it's good for her. It's good for where she's going and would make a difference in her prospects and her accomplishments. Okay, let's do Togo. <laughs> uh, Togo is really the Togolese Republic and it's in West Africa. It's a really tiny country. When you look at a map, you think you've just dropped a toenail clipping on it and you go, oop, 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 oop. oh no, it's Togo. It's only 71 miles, I think, from one side of the country to the other one. You could drive it in an hour. What makes Togo interesting? is that in the 16th, 17th and 18th century, this is where the slaves came from, Togo and surrounding countries. Then in 1884, Germany took over, called it Togoland. Then the French took over and stayed until about 1960, I think, when Togo got its uh, independence. Within seven years of gaining its independence, there was a military coup and uh, the military took over and the guy who took over stayed in power until his death for 38 years and this was all mired in murky voter fraud stuff and uh, you know when people say wow american elections are like third world countries well you're talking about togo <laughs> basically because that's uh, got a history of elections where the lindsey graham of togoland somehow gets 71 percent of the vote hmm, how did that happen so i did his pictures and i had to make togo out as a person right the country has to be a person and it came across this bar on the ground it gets down, curious, and starts scraping away at this bar. And it gets bigger and bigger, and it turns into the size of a doorstep. Now, I did wonder whether this wasn't a growing resistance movement that had been small and secret up to now, because 
Togo has a history of terrible human rights violations and that female genital mutilation stuff and there's a lot of bad stuff goes on uh, when the government's involved there. So there was this bar maybe of resistance. It swept away some of the sand and the more sand it swept away the bigger it became this resistance. In the end Togo goes well there's nothing we can do about that let's march on. It goes forward and as I was watching, the step starts covering over with sand again. Almost like, well, there was a resistance movement, but, well, you know, we're over that now. We're past that now. It was a little bit of an uprising or a little bit of a problem, and now we're past it. Everything's sorted out now. There was a rise after which the terrain went from duny, hilly, sandy stuff to like a freshly combed beach. But there was a general feeling as I walked with it that underneath the sand hidden was the rest of this step. That had Togo kept on digging, the whole thing would have been step. Now it could mean that, oh my god, isn't Togo lovely? Look at this place, it's great. But dig deeper and there's this core of not goodness underneath it all. It's not so great when you dig down. Maybe that's what the step is. Or it could be the reverse, that the military regime is encountering resistance and that resistance is going to stay there. It's not going to go anywhere. It doesn't matter how you smooth over it. It doesn't matter what excuses you make or how you buff it up or rig the elections or whatever. There'll always be that resistance to rule in Togo. Okay, let's do Madison Cawthorn. He's the guy in the wheelchair who is the representative for the 11th Congressional District of North Carolina. And uh, he's a recent addition, very, very young. He's a recent addition to the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. The last time I did the pictures for him, he was going down a hallway and he was tearing down curtains to expose Congress, to expose the secrets, to expose... You know, it was just like, I'm Madison Cawthorn and I'm going to tear this place down. He's very gung-ho. In the new set of pictures, it wasn't like that at all. In fact, he wasn't in a wheelchair in these pictures. The atmosphere was very dark around him. Lots of dark energy around this guy now. And he was crawling along a duct or a subterranean passageway or a crawl space under a corridor or something. And he was just sneakily doing what he did. Trying not to be seen doing it, I thought. He said, well, there was lots of voter fraud at the election, and then he goes on CNN, and when he's challenged, he goes, oh, well, maybe there wasn't voter fraud, and maybe Biden did win. It's, like, yeah, it's that kind of thing. So he's trying to stay under the radar somehow. He's crawling down this duct, and at one point he goes, I think this is it. So he throws back a trap door and looks around him and goes, oh, no, no, this isn't the one. So he ducks down again, closes the trap door, and continues. He's planning something. He's plotting something. There's something he's trying to get done that is being done in secret, I think, as far as the pictures go, and he's ready to reveal it at some point, or he's ready to reveal himself at some point. I'm not sure. So he carries on, and he does it again. He goes, this is the one. I'm sure this is the one. He opens the trap door. He looks around. Oh, oh no. Okay, it's not that one either. He closes it again, <laughs> right? He continues. As he's crawling along this space, he finds a way to adjust. There's another avenue that he could go down. He goes down it, he follows it around, and it comes up into a vestibule which has a magnificent sunny vista outside of it, which suggests he might leave Congress, I suppose, and go on to brighter things. He's up for re-election in 2022. Maybe it's that. Or something really goes right for him. If he just continues as he is. However, over to the left here, there was a dark, dismal corridor. 
that led into really murky territory. If at that point he goes, no, I don't want wonderful things to happen. This looks more interesting. This is murky. I think I'm going to go down there. If he does that, indeed, he will get exactly the consequences uh, he was hoping for. <laughs> that kind of boomerang is not going to come back and hit you very well. It's going to actually hurt. Madison. Next, I did Don Jr. His pictures were really, really simple. He was on stilts. And from up here, where he was, everything looked pretty great. Now, you might say, well, he's high. <laughs> That's why it looks great, because he's high. But he was high on these stilts. And everything looked great. And as long as he stayed balanced, manoeuvring these stilts across the landscape, and didn't do anything rash, he was okay in his own head. To him, it was all good. But there's a cattle grid. And cattle grids appear sometimes in these pictures, representing a hard terrain to cross. I mean, if you're a Frisian cow watching this, then yes, it's very hard. A human being has to watch very carefully that he doesn't or she doesn't break her ankle going across one of these things. So he's on stilts. Don Jr. is on stilts. So he's like, oh, this is great. Everything's going to be fine. Nothing can touch me. The stilts get caught in the cattle grid throwing him off balance completely. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. One goes one way, one goes the other way, one gets stuck between the metal rods. He loses a stilt and ends up clinging to a pole. It's his last hope. And he's vulnerable, even though high up this pole, he felt a little invincible, like, well, it'll all work itself out. I'll be fine. I'm up this pole. Nothing could touch me up this pole. I think he's in for a surprise. Talking about his father as well. There was a slope and 45 was walking down this slope. The ground was covered in smashed bottles. Trump wine, perhaps. Who knows? But uh, smashed bottles, jagged edges, thousands of them everywhere. He was in thin-soled leather shoes. And as he walked over this broken glass, it cut through his shoes, lacerating his feet to the point where it was really hurting. But he couldn't show it. He had to keep on smiling. Meanwhile, the pain is excruciating. Not literal physical pain. Metaphorical business pain. Legal pain. Financial pain. But, as so often happens with this man, there's a ledge he comes to, another path. He climbs onto this path, and now he can walk forward. Maybe he has good lawyers that he's not going to pay, but he's got good lawyers. Uh, maybe he finds a, a, a way out temporarily. Who knows? But whatever it is, there is a little escape route comes up and he's so relieved. I pushed him forward and then there was a cliff face. Dark, ominous cliff face blocking his path and it cast a gigantic shadow over him. And when I left him, he was just in this shadow gazing up at this cliff face going, oh my God, how am I going to get out of this? What is going to happen to me? Forget the PR. He's in pain. And this is what he's facing. <sighs> okay, let's do George Harrison's transition pictures. <laughs> let's rescue ourselves from this, this dark, dark place by doing George Harrison's transition pictures. This guy had several careers, really. He was in the Beatles, obviously. Then he had his solo career. Then he joined the Travelling Wilburys, formed that, and had massive hits with that. He also financed Monty Python's Life of Brian, the number one comedy of all time, probably. Uh, he financed that by mortgaging his house. In fact, a friend of mine, two years ago, 
went to stay with his wife, Olivia, at Friar Park, which is the house that they had, and uh, said it was a lovely place and that George loved gardening and that the gardens were immaculate because of George. But he was obviously, in the 1960s, he was lured into the, in a, in a lovely way, lured into the Hare Krishna thing. And whereas both John and George were LSD guys who saw spirituality in the world and whatever and wanted love for everybody and peace. John Lennon didn't go down the God route in the end. John Lennon said, I, I think we're all responsible for our own actions, which were reflected in the pictures last time. Whereas George Harrison went down the Hindu road. In fact, when he died in 2001 of lung cancer, his ashes were spread on the Ganges in India. So when I went into his pictures for his transition, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. And at first, you know, I wait in this symbolic tunnel for the person to arrive in whatever form they arrive. And he simply didn't show up. What I didn't realize was that I was standing in the wrong place. I was expecting him to come in conventionally, and he didn't. Over here, further down, further into the process, there was a second tunnel entrance, kind of up there. George Harrison, his spirit, was peering in through the hole, but he was huge. Now, if you take it that a big tunnel and a small person is meant to indicate that greatness, as I said with John Lennon, greatness doesn't extend beyond death. You may be great in life, but that doesn't mean you're great in the afterlife. You're just a soul, a consciousness traveling. He had the opposite of that. He was almost too big for the tunnel, almost like he was really humble really switched on to what the process was and really knew himself at his core. There's an amazing meme going around. Uh, it appeared on Instagram, I think, from Anita Morjani. And she says, as you love yourself, love the real you, the you who has feet of clay, the you who has failed, the you who has succeeded, even the you who sometimes receives criticism, love all of you, because that is the real you. And that's what came to mind when I did George Harrison's pictures, that this was the real him, humble, open, willing to experience what was going on but maybe with preconceptions about what it was going to be. So I get him down the tunnel, and as he goes along, he gets smaller as he realizes that he didn't fully understand what was going to happen, that it was new, this to him. But as he walked along, he was scuffing himself against the side of the rock wall. I mean, it's not really rock, you understand that, it's symbolic, but it was scuffing his arm against the rock. And it was kind of chafing, like, we're taking this layer of skin off you. Because this is your layer of skin that relates to the expectation you had of this process. This is making it harder for you to transition because you come with these preconceptions. That's what was really remarkable about this. With a lot of people, they seem to have to be built up for the process. They have to be guided through because they're fearful or doubting or whatever. With him, it wasn't like that at all. Some people gasp for air because there's no air here. And it's like, ah, I need to breathe. But they don't need to breathe. He didn't have a problem with that. It was like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Very easy, but it still needed scuffing. It still needed a little bit of abrasion to wipe off, to knock off, to chip off some of the expectations about this process. But it wasn't about humility, it was simply about being realistic about what this was. And as he walks, the uplift happens. That sense of 
you know, this is shifting sands beneath your feet. You can just lift. Just, you know, rise up. And he did. With remarkable compliance and ease and willingness. Yeah, look at this. Floaty, floaty. Off he went. Very easy. But once again, the hands of grace, these angel hands that pull you forward, that, that in, induce you into the final stages of this transition. These hands didn't pull him forward. They wafted him to the sides of the tunnel. They buffeted him to scrape even more preconceptions off him. To take him from what he had been when he started off this process to being more raw. Very interesting. It's like we have to drop our meta-narrative. What we've been told will happen is not what happens. What we are expecting is not what really is going to happen because it's a process unto itself. And human mortal meta-narratives, no matter how powerful and convincing they are, don't necessarily capture the reality of what this process is. And he arrives at the same metaphorical chamber I always see. No resistance whatsoever, like, wow. Oh, wow. And he floated around it. And you know when you get a splinter in your, in your hand, it goes under your flesh and it slides in and you have to kind of pull it out? You know, it's like it goes in sideways. It's really annoying. That's how he slipped into this membrane thing that I always see. He floated around it. He got closer to it, closer to it, closer to it, and then slid under, as though there was a flap, and he slid under the flap. And for a second or two, I could just see his shape beneath the surface of this dome thing. And then he faded away and was gone. That was that. To me, that was one of the most interesting ones I've done. Because there's so much resistance in other people's pictures. Like, no, I don't want to go. Or I want it on my terms. Or I've got to go back. There are things I've got to deal with. We've seen all of that. With this, it was just like, I have prepared for this as part of my life path. I've waited for this, not wanted it necessarily, but I have waited to experience what this moment would be. And it was almost savoured with utter compliance. But the most interesting thing was the fact that his preparations spiritually um, from his teachers, his mentors, those who had shaped his views on what death is about, those things that form preconceptions, that outer skin, had to be removed. Because it was as much of an obstacle to transitioning as resistance or ignorance or willfulness. Ego. Which really is a fascinating side of the meta-narrative thing I've been talking about for quite a time. How those tribal scripts help us in life form a community, be part of something, to belong, to relate to other people who have similar beliefs. But once you go into the death process, the transition process, that isn't a necessary tool you need. You don't need that support. In fact, you need to lose it, lose the beliefs in order to um, move through the process in a way that's the most efficacious. In order to embrace your destiny, in order for your soul to be open enough to embrace your destiny. To me, that is the most fascinating thing.
I learnt a lot from George Harrison. Um, much as I loved his music in, in, in life, in death, I learnt a tremendous amount from him. So I'm incredibly grateful. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, like, subscribe, you know, all the rest of the stuff. Follow me on Twitter if you want, at Cash Peters. Uh, but stay safe, that's really important. Uh, this ordeal is almost over for us and uh, soon we'll be free. All right, uh, have a great week, guys. I'll speak to you very soon. Bye-bye.